So this week, to, in order to talk about this Ames housing data, um, Connor randomly made, well, I don't know how random it was, but he made an app that is very related. And so he's going to walk us through his app and the process that he used to make it and all the stuff related to that. Um, I think we can go ahead and get started with that. And we have, we can do any bookkeeping or whatever administrative stuff at the end. So Connor, take it away. All right. Thanks, uh, John. Um, it, it wasn't random, um, but it wasn't causal. It was correlated. Um, so yeah, I uh, I can drop this link in the chat here. It is live on shinyapps.io, so people can fool around with it as we go here. Just maybe don't crash it. It's on the free one. Um, so yeah, the, the county publishes a whole bunch of, of information about house, uh, actually parcel sales uh, going back, you know, over a hundred years ago. Um, so there's a rich data set um, and uh, it's a really good exercise in data cleansing and EDA. Um, you know, there's a lot of messy data. There's, you know, probably 60 to 120 fields, depending on which tables you join. Um, so let me share my screen here. I forgot to do that. Um, and uh, so yeah, I wanted to, to get um, an idea of what um, is this showing for everybody. Yeah, thanks, John. Yes. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, to be able to click around, see which regions um, and house styles and house sizes correlate with um, price. Um, so, so this is what it looks like. We have our leaflet app in the top right here, and then just some some inputs on the left. Um, and, and these all these all feed into a reactive table that gets updated as it goes in Shiny, and then it, that gets fed into the predict function. So I, I read in the model fit from a saved RDS file, and then this just updates live. So we can click, um, I don't know, say, I don't know if how, how many people are familiar with Pittsburgh, Allegheny County geography. Um, Mount Lebanon is uh, one of the more posh neighborhoods in, in the area. Um, so we can see it, it automatically updates, you know, we can click around. Um, I chose the bag free model um, because I saw Julia Silky did it in one of her videos. And I tried to ran a forest, but the prediction time was, was way too long. So it wasn't as quick to update on the predictions. Um, even the bag tree takes longer to fit. Maybe that's because of my settings, but it takes, it's pretty fast on prediction. So we can, so grade is the initial build quality of the house. Condition is the condition of the house as it was sold. Um, lot area, finished stepping size, beds, baths, and then the year the, year the house was built. Um, a lot of these, aren't fed into the model as such. There's some transformation that goes on behind the scenes in the recipe, which I can go through. Um, but let's say, so, so we'll go to Mount Lebanon. We'll say, you know, it's a very nice um, construction style house, kept up well, um, lot area, square feet, say it's, you know, 7,000, 2,000 square feet square, say it's a three bed, two bath, built just post-war period. So we can see this is well above average um, for the region. So this histogram is built off of the same house type, which is here, and the region, which is being pulled from the leaflet app. So this updates live and it just filters on. So it gives the user a, a comparison to see where their hypothetical house fits in the overall distribution for similar things. Um, and then I have just the average predicted price to the prediction that I have their inputs over here. Um, I couldn't figure out how to get confidence intervals for the bag tree, 
I was able to do it for Random Forest, and, and the, the, my first model was was um, just LM, um, and that worked out. Pretty, it actually worked pretty well. Um, but you know, you can click, click around and see if you go to um, Council District. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, where a bunch of people. Here's, so this is like Shady Side and Squirrel Hill ish. Um, so CMU is right is around here, for example, and Pitt is right here. Um, so you can see there's much fewer sales of that home type in this area compared to, to Mount Lebanon. Um, and the histogram up, updates accordingly. Um, you can flip around and, and, and maybe try a condo. Um, the condo lot area is always zero. So that's something I'm still working on the UI with. Um, so one of the big design decisions I made in the model was that the lot area is, uh, is actually a z-score based on the area that, that it's in. So it's so a forgiven lot area, how much is it below or above average compared to other lots in that region. Um, and then finished living area, it's also scaled but it's scaled against the style of the house. So if it's a Victorian, you get less credit for having a big house because that's standard for that house size. If you have a 3,000 square foot condo, you know that, that gets you much more in terms of price. So that, that's way above average. Um, so are there any questions on how this works, either on the shiny end or um, modeling side? My dogs are barking, but um, well, I, I guess for starters, like how much, um, like how much cleaning did you have to do on this data set? Oh and, yeah, like um, yeah, a large amount, large amount. <laughs> um, so the actual um, assessment data set is includes it's not just residential parcels; it's also like business and governments and uh, like parks and things like that. So I had to um, try to get, move my screen over here. Sorry, it's not cooperating. Um, no, it's full screen, that's why. Um, get my our studio over here. Um, so if I go to my, my scripts here, um, there was a ton of data cleansing I had to do um, just to get it in a shape where you can make a reasonable EDA off of it. You're just exploring the data. Um, clean here, clean assessments, here we are. Um, so yeah, so this is the data source I saved as a comments. Um, I had to use room because it's kind of a big file up front. Um, I cleaned up the um, column names myself uh, a little bit. I used janitor and then had to do some extra work on it. Um, filtered only on valid sales. Um, so if it was a gift or um, the other one, so this data set that I filtered down to only includes valid sales of individual parcels. So if someone buys two parcels and then combines them or whatever, that, that is not included in this data set. Um, so um, so yeah, I did all sorts of filtering to get all the business and government uh, parcels out of there. Um, let's see, um, some basic munging with Luber date to get the dates right. Um, filtered on everything after 1975. Um, there were some sales prices that were under $100, even for valid sales. Um, so I just, you know, excluded those. There was one parcel that was in a, you know, aggressively average part of town. And uh, it was recorded a sale as like $40 million, um, which is you know, astronomical. So I think they just messed up where the decimal point, point was on that transaction, because it should have been around you know, $40,000 based on the, the comparison parcels. 
So, you know, there's a lot of just manual inspecting the data, going on Google Maps, looking up addresses to figure out like what's going on with this stuff. Um, and of course the documentation is all hit and miss. Um, I also did some munging on the back end. There were like multiple condo types and row houses. It's like there's there's row, there's row end, and there's row interior. I just said it's all, it's all a row house. I'm not gonna have the model interpret those things separately. Um, and then cleaning up the municipality names um, and school districts. Um, that that was just a bunch of trial and error to get those things to match up. Um, because of course the school district, you know, there could, there could be an extra space somewhere or the capitalizes differently, or there's a period where in one data set and some period in the other. Uh, so just a whole lot of anti-joins to figure out what, what didn't go right. Um, see, I used across here, which was fun just to clean up all these things, um, remove some characters, string squish, which is pretty nice to get rid of white space. Um, this is a big one. I forgot to do it initially and my model improved drastically. This, this adjusts all the prices to $2019. So it adjusts for inflation, which lets me that, go back. What's that function from? Um, I, it was a GitHub package, uh, price R. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, I found a couple different ways to do it. This one seemed to be the the most straightforward. Um, yeah, it has currencies for you know international, like all, all different countries, years, whatnot. Um, and that really improved the performance of the model. It gave me some more data to work with. Um, let's see, I, I also pulled in some geographic data um, because there is, the original data set had, it tells you which town the, the, the parcel is in and which school district it's in. Um, and, but the school district is, you know, it's a big county and all the suburbs have their own school districts, but then the city is all one school district. And so that, that wasn't as fine green as I wanted it to be because the city is pretty heterogeneous. So I wanted to be able to have the model chew on different parts of the city easier. So I eventually made a Frankenstein shape file of suburban school districts, city council districts, and then the one neighborhood called Mount Oliver, which is actually, it's an enclave, enclave in the city. It's within the borders of the city, but it's not part of the city because they were, they resisted being assimilated back in 1925 or something. And so they use all the city, you know, functions and sc schools and, and firehouses and whatnot, but they're their own town still. Uh, so that makes data cleaning, you know, just more fun. Um, so this was just making that Frankenstein of a shape file, getting those names cleaned up, you know, all the all the fun stuff that you do. You know, it's the nine percent is cleaning and everything else is, you know, oh, yeah. here and there. Um, so so yeah, this gets me to my um, clean assessment data file, which is you know an optimistic name for a file, but here we are. Um, so load a whole bunch of packages, um, skim it to figure out what's going on, focus on the columns I want. Um, I'm not gonna run this because it's like 160,000 rows and once you start creating models with with, uh, uh, with cross-validation and whatnot, it just, it's slow everything down. But I've got some saved stuff we can look at. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how long you want me to go on, but I've got some model diagnostics and EDA um, documents to, to show too. Um, well, I think given what the chapter is, we should, we should make sure that we dive like really completely into what you did to understand the data set and okay. then the modeling stuff for sure. Like, you know, show it to us, but that's stuff that we'll be talking about more later. Yeah. Okay. Um, um so here. I guess to, uh, to inflict the, uh, the, the things that he talked about, um, did you have anything like, did you do any, like visualizing to make sure that the the you talked about that some of the neighborhoods didn't make sense or whatever. Um, like how much did you have to do to to fix like that? You know, finding data that's clearly wrong, that kind of thing. Like you had the one where the or you had the filter for the less than hundred dollars, that kind of EDA. 
Um, yeah. Like, how did you get there? <laughs> also, Connor, um, did you do any address validity checks? Like, did you actually have to validate that the addresses, like the zip codes, etc., like they were, um, they were like correct in terms of uh, what's been input? Sure. So the county actually has a, uh, so it has the assessment data set, which has the parcel ID. It also has um, the parcel geography. So you can get a shape file for each parcel. Um, and then I calculated the centroid off of that. Oh, very cool. So then I was able to, and that got me, I could get out of the box that I was in with the, uh, the initial data set just at the school districts, right? But that was, you know, the, the entire city was one thing and then each suburban Dook and Cranny had their own separate school districts. So I was able to do some spatial joins with uh, SF um, against the, the, the city council districts and that Frankenstein thing I made. Um, so, so yeah, I, I can go through, I, I got some graphs here about more about the cleaned data and I can talk about, you know, some of the decisions I made to get here. Um, yeah, I think uh, Yoni had a question about um, what were the yeah. original motivations for cleaning the data? So was it like, were you like given this as like homework as a preset task or just data driven? Um, no, I like, um, so the county, works with um, the University of Pittsburgh. They have a Western Pennsylvania regional data center. They host all sorts of cool data about the city and the county. Um, so the uh, requests. Uh, um, I think the question, stuff. yeah, the question is more, did, 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 you come into, did you come into the task with preset ideas of what you wanted to clean up front to make the data more amenable for modeling? Or is it more, you started doing it and you saw this doesn't fit and that doesn't fit. That's okay then. And uh, and then you went forward through that. How what what kind of process did you use? Yeah, um, I mean it was so I came in. The initial motivation was to create a model of of the parcel uh, sale price. So and it was very iterative. You know, if you go on um, or for data science, there's that small graph that Hadley shows all the time with the circle, with all those steps. And that's what it was. Um, you know, do some, do, just read it, look at it with glimpse and make some graphs, figure out what, what's what, and then clean it and find a hundred things that fell through the cracks, clean it again, make some more graphs, check it out. And then you start making some scatter plots and box plots of what relates to price, how, um, and then that's when I started to make some decisions for uh, the features of the model itself. Did you have any any hypothesis hypotheses that you wanted to check before you started to clean the data? Um, I, I just wanted to get a representative sample. Um, so I, I was pretty. I feel like I was pretty hands off in terms of data cleaning. I did, I tried I tried to exclude as little as possible. Um, so that I'm sure there's things in there that I missed. There's some missing data that I impute in the recipe. Um, but yeah, the point was of the exercise was to was to get a data set that was good enough to make a basic model with, and then try to learn this all this all tidy models thing. Um, and then the other part was to see if I had overpaid for my house when I bought it two years ago. Uh -huh. So I wondered selfish. about that. I, I never got to it. I'm um, We're actually closing on a new house on Monday and we just accepted an offer on our current house. And I never got around to trying to find if Austin has this and do this. Like I, I kept telling my wife, you know, I really should. This is like, this is like the basic modeling problem. It's the example in everything. I, I should go do this, but it was whatever. It got taken care of. And so I didn't bother. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's as, a, as a, in terms of learning, it's probably easier to use the AIMS data set just because it comes, you know, clean. Yeah. It's got documentation. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's a different enterprise entirely to try and wrangle <laughs> all this data from like the city open data, open data portal, you know? I, I thought it was really interesting that even given the, you know, starting from AIMS, um, there are things that they do um, whenever they're working with it with tidy models to clean it up more. 
<laughs> like, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, some of it was the log transform, and that's you know that's a a choice to make. But also, you know, he he went into that. Yeah, there are these houses that are just wrong, <laughs> you know, and even in this relatively clean data set. So, that yeah, I mean, and there's all sorts of, um, you know, it helps to have some domain knowledge. So mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I've, I've lived in Pittsburgh for more than 10 years now. <laughs> um, and I've, I've been through the, the, the buying process. So I'm, I'm sort of familiar with a couple of neighborhoods. Um, and I've lived in a couple of different areas. So I know like what house types are more common in which areas, things like that. Um, so, I mean, I, I've got a short EDA document on, on, on the cleaned file and we can sort of go through that and then back up and talk about how I got there if we want to. Sure. Oh, I, I guess one other question I have about this is, have you uh, submitted this to uh, Thomas yet for Tidy Tuesday? Uh, no, this is, this is the, beta, <laughs> this is the beta run right here. You okay. See if it stands up on its own. It can walk a few steps. Um, but yeah, I think that'd be cool. Um, cause it's got, you know, it's 160,000 records since 1975. Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a bear to get your hands around. So it, it's, it's kind of a challenge. Cool. All right. Um, so just a glimpse on, on the data itself, we got 19 columns. I use most of them in the actual model. Um, this one, these first three I don't use. That's more metadata, uh, but the rest of it, I think I do use. Um, yeah, so this is the target available right here. So sales price adjusted for inflation in 2019 dollars. Um, so, you know, 19 columns, nine character and 10 numeric. And we messed with that in the recipe a little bit to get that cleaned up as we want to, um, not much missing data. Um, again, this is just an ID column, so that's not useful. Um, but it's nice for troubleshooting. Um, so we have the sale, we have the sale price and the sale price adjusted, which I do for, I keep that around for exploratory data purposes. Um, so yeah, the, the, this year the house was built, number of bedrooms, full baths, half baths, finished living area, lot area, sale year, house age of sale, and then sale price adjusted. So I, this one gets dropped. I don't use that in the model. I just use this because um, if the house was built in 1890 and you bought it in 1940, it's 50 years old. If you buy a house that was built in 1890, now it's, more than 50, I can't do the math, but you know. So did that, you do that, that with, um, sorry, just jumping in. Did you do that with uh, feature selection at all or did you just decide that you would rather just focus on like the house's age itself? I, 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 that was just a decision I made. Cool. Because of the, the, the wide time period I have, you know, if, if the house was built in 1975 and, and sold in 1976, like that has a different feel to it as a buyer than if you bought a house built in 75 now. Yeah, I think it's just, I'm just curious about it because I do, so I'm in home building. So I do a lot of um, construction costs modeling mm -hmm. and the date at which you sign the contract really matters. Like it's not just how old the house is. Obviously all the houses are new when I work, you know, when you work in home building, but I'm just curious because like, you know, we talk about housing booms and bu like bubbles and so on. So it's not just the age of the house that matters, but also what year. So like if the market's really hot, you know, mm -hmm, a certain mm -hmm. year and so on. So I'm, I'd be curious to know, like, to just to see if like, like as an extension for this, when you go back to it or whatever, yeah. um, if the year itself made a difference. So that if you bought the house in 2022, you know, what that would look like compared to if you bought the house today. Yeah. Um, or 2007 mm -hmm. versus 2009. For yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, that's definitely something I would add. So, so the actual year and maybe also the month because yeah. house sales uh, are pretty seasonal. So There's a whole lot of activity over the summer because mm -hmm. a lot of people with kids are not really, are hesitant to move during the school year. So everyone buys 
from May through August. Um, so that might, um, so that probably causes some bidding wars just because of that constrained time period. So that'd be something else I would, I'd think about adding too. Yeah. Um, just to, to pause for a second, I'm sure there are people who don't, uh, um, aren't familiar with Skimmer. So mm. could you describe how you made this cool uh, histogram within your output there? Yeah, so <laughs> package is skim R and then just skim on your data set. And this is a markdown. So it, it just, this will pop up in your output, either in your console or if you're in markdown in the little drop down below your snippet. So it, it gives a pretty good summary, you know, the name of the data set, the number of records, all the column types, if any, any grouping that's going on, number of missing um, rows in each column, which is pretty cool. Um, and then uh, it actually rounds, it, there's some rounding here, there's 22 missing, the 22 out of 160,000 is like 0. 0.005 or whatever it is. So I, th I think it just rounds up here. Um, also some, some quartiles and min max, et cetera. White space, that's a cool one. So if you have characters like names, I guess that tells you if there's any white space in those rows. Um, and then it gives you, so th that's all your character um, columns. This is all your numeric columns. Uh, so it gives, shows you a uh, quartiles, histogram, mean standard deviation, and then also your missing stuff as well. Um, so it's, it's a pretty cool way to just get a quick look at your data and you can use it as a, as a check when you're doing some data cleansing, you know. So if you think you caught all the missing stuff, or if you think you caught all the care, all the rows that had white space, you know, it, this can double check that for you. Cool thing I just learned about Skimmer is these are data frames, so you can use tidy commands on them. I I've like dropped columns because it was too wide, or if you wanted to tr like round or, or transform the data. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty slick. I've I've only started using it in the past month, probably, but. So pretty nice. Um, There's a question in the chat about, did you think about including an additional data sets such as Zillow's forecasts? Um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've poked around Zillow's API a couple of times. I didn't see anything that was address specific, at least in the free tier. I know they do summary it, um, stats on the, the census metro areas or zip codes, um, but I, there, there might be a data set out there that could that could be a good check. I, I did do some manual checks. Um, I, like I did made some predictions and looked up the address in in Zillow and and see how well they matched up. It did pretty well. Um, like sometimes it's like off by maybe twenty thousand in either direction, just because. Of bidding wars, maybe, um, right. or, if the, or if the sales rep was a real jerk, you know, who knows? There's all sorts of, all, like anyone who's bought a home or even tried, you know, there's all sorts of, it's a very noisy uh, <laughs> transaction process. Um, so, any other questions? Uh, for some reason, I can't, sh I can't see my chat right now. So if there's anything pops up, John, just tell me. Yeah. Um... Pavitra has a question, but I don't know how to pronounce that package, so I'm going to make her do it, if she can. Well, I'm going to say it in my Daisy accent, uh, <laughs> Esquiz, <laughs> probably worse off. Uh, she asked, is Esquiz comparable with Skimmer? Are, are you familiar with the this package? I'm not familiar with that no, package. No, I'm not. Uh, they're different. Okay. Esquiz is for um, uh, building uh tg plots uh and shiny okay skimmer is a quick console type way to, uh, to look at the data all right uh go ahead and continue through um so again this is a clean data set so you can imagine you know i may i went through this process a couple times um, so for example, if, if there was a whole bunch of sales between relatives, then those would all be recorded as $0 as a transaction. So that would be, that would skew this uh, density curve way over to the left. Um, so I, I sort of 
looked at the data set and filtered out things that didn't make sense because I, I want the market value of the parcel. Um, so you sort of play around with it, filter on different things, and it ends up being pretty normal. Um, about, I think it's 115,000 or so is the peak of the curve there. Um, and again, that's in 2019 dollars. I thought this was a cool thing. Um, so the blue is the inflation adjusted and the red is, is the, I guess, nominal, nominal, nominal dollars, you know, so the sale is in, in, in 80 there, that, that's in, in the currency for that period of time. So if you're trying to model things like this is all, the inflation is, you know, it's not useful information, it's noise. So if you can strip that out of your target variable, because um, I, I, you know, I don't care about inflation from 1980. I want, I want to, I want to, to be able to put it all in one currency. So I just want to choose one year and focus on that. Um, so location. Um, so this is colored by me, by the median sales price. So that, so there's a, you know, definitely a couple places that stand out. Um, Upper St. Clair was big, um, Mount Lebanon. Um, this is the shady side, Squirrel Hill area around uh, CMU. Uh, lots of old, nice houses and some, some new condos and things like that. Um, this is a lot of the new suburb housing. There's been a, a big housing boom in this area. Big lot areas, big houses, you know, four or five bedrooms two, three bathrooms and 10,000 10, square feet lot sizes at least. So pretty big new houses. Um, this is where um, a lot of really nice old homes are. So houses built in 1895, 1905. They, they were the summer homes for the steel, for the steel barons actually. Um, that's where they built a lot of their homes. And if you're a hockey fan. Um, that's where Sidney Crosby and Mario Lemieux live out in Swickley. So there's a, there's a lot of money out there. Um, so this is a box plot of of the sale price, you know, is ordered by the median sale price. So this is that that one by CMU. Um, that that's the one way up north, and you can just tell it goes all the way down. I should have put a um, vertical line on this, but you can tell that, that the region definitely is gonna play a role in the model here. They're colored by the number of sales too. So the brighter it is, the more sales there were. So, so some of these places don't have many at all. Um, before, before you go on, there was an yeah. interesting question in the chat. How much like validation did you do on the um, that price R package, the inflation, or did you just you know, hope because you didn't, because you were playing. Yeah, I didn't do a ton of validation. Um, I, I looked at a couple of different packages and they all seemed pretty similar. Um, I believe the guy that wrote this package is an economist. So I sort of left it up to him. <laughs> I, I totally accept that kind of argument because I, there are times when that, that's what makes sense. Um, it very well could oh. be that that it did that there's an error, you know, it's either in the code or, or in the package or my implementation of it. Um, so if anyone knows about inflation in 1980 and <laughs> my graph is wrong, please tell me. And apparently it is on CRAN, actually. So, okay. Um, cool. So they passed CRAN CMD check. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it doesn't. Yeah, don't, say, sorry. Don't, yeah, that does. <laughs> <laughs> that does not say anything about accuracy in case anyone doesn't know that. Just means um, it compiles. I have a yeah. lot of really bad packages on crimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it does mean at least <laughs> at least you can go install it. You can find it and it will like it'll stay compatible or it will disappear from CRAN. Um, yeah. It won't break your computer. It will not hack into it will not change your files and whatever your your, the performance of which you probably have to deal with yourself. Yeah, there's no warranty for any of this stuff. <laughs> That's what MIT is. <laughs> Sorry, go um, ahead, John. 
Uh, so this is the, the house age at the sale date. Um, so again, going to the right, it gets older. Um, so this is a pretty, you know, I, I made this and I thought, okay, that makes sense. As it gets older, it loses value, but it's, um, you know, you can see that some houses do retain value and some houses lose value faster. Um, and I've always wanted to use the word heteroscedastic in real life. So, so here we are. Um, Cause it does get wider out by the tails there. Um, lottery and sales price. This was one up when I was doing the initial EDA. I thought that's kind of weird. Um, but then I realized that lot area also varies a lot by region. Sorry, John, is this too small? I can zoom. Um, yeah, if you can zoom a little, that'd be good. Aggression. How's that? Good. That looks yeah. great. I'm mostly concerned about like people who are watching this later. Yeah, yeah. YouTube and might not um, blow it up to full screen. Yeah. And I've got this all in a markdown so I can I can share it with you guys and put it on, on the book side if you want to. Um, so yeah, this is when I decided to adjust the uh, lot area as a Z-score compared to other houses in the region. Um, Cause this didn't, like this makes sense to me but it didn't make sense to use the model as such. Um, so you can see that this is the area or the region and then plot area on the on the x-axis there. So if these are all core city areas with small plot area parcels and you get bigger and bigger as you move into the suburbs. And Pine Ridge Hill is that one that we saw at the very top of the map there. Big houses, big lots. But it would make sense to compare a house that was you know sold here with a house, you know, right next to CMU, you know, maybe it's a row home or maybe it's a old style, you know, but it's really packed in there in the block. Um, lottery, uh, and lottery also varies by style of the house, but not as much. So that's why I, I decided to go with the region as the comparison there. Um, finished living area. So that's the area inside the house that's considered livable. Again, this is an old square feet. Um, so this made sense to me, you know, it increases there's some variation um, in some areas, but in general, more living area, square footage, the higher the prices. Uh, but again, it does vary by the style of the house. So Victorians and Tudors, those have a lot of indoor square footage. Um, and, you know, these uh, multifamily homes and row homes and things like that have much smaller indoor living space, which makes sense. Um, same finished living area by um, the region again, not surprising at all. Um, so this is the grade of the house compared to the, the sales price. Um, so this is the quality of, const of construction. Um, so obviously like most houses are, are considered average construction quality. So that's where the most uh, sales are. Um, and it's also pretty much in the middle in terms of sale price, which make, makes sense. And I figured it would make sense to collapse these variables, or these, these, uh, these levels in the recipe, just to make it a bit simpler for the model to chew on. What is the, um, the fill? The fill is the number, a number of transactions for houses uh, that were average or good or very sense. good. Um, Condition of the house at sale, again, so, you know, all the way from very good to unsound with some missing in there. But again, average had the most transactions and it's dead in the middle. So this is another one where I chose to collapse the top and bottom tiers. So I think I ended up with four levels in each. And, and I used average as the reference um, level for each of those. Um, so these are the housing styles. There's four main types and then a whole bunch of types with smaller amounts. So I ended up collapsing these as well, um, keeping I think the top 
four or five and collapsing the rest into other based on the number of transactions for that type. Um, Hold on for just a sec. I, yeah. I need to be a, the teacher for a second. So um, to, to go with some of the stuff that he talks about in the chapter, uh, how did you decide which of the things, like, you know, price, I think you always um, log transform. Mm -hmm. Did you did you think about log transforming? And number one, did you log transform the price in the modeling as well? Yes. Yeah, I did that in the model. And did you consider log transforming anything else? Uh, I did. I did not log transform anything else. I'm considering trying it on the lot area and um, and the finished living space. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering how that would intersect with my Z-score transformation. Okay. Um, so I might, yeah, I might, might, might create a separate recipe and try that instead of doing the Z-score, just take a log 10 of those. Yeah. Then, um, is there, I guess there was quite a bit of it, like looking at your, your app, there's quite a bit of variability in mm -hmm. those, right? So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And those are, there's a lot of, uh, correlation between finished living space, lot area and the region and the house style. Um, so I, I tried to shave a little, I tried to shave the rough ends off, but that's why I chose a tree model. Um, cause I feel like it would handle those, those, those more discrete, um, issues in the data better. And yeah, uh, Tyler asked um a lot of pricing is done and for sure as um like dollars per square foot did you do any um like feature engineering for anything like that or kind of let it play out from the separate variables no i didn't adjust the the price per square foot that would be interesting um that would put it on a different scale for sure on the target variable um but yeah, that would be interesting to see how it, how it would play with the big houses versus the row homes and condos downtown. Right. Um, that would be something else to explore for sure. And I guess um, to, to harp on it a little bit because we've got questions uh, and anyone is free to uh, jump in on this because I don't want to put Connor on the spot, but just uh, uh, tips on how to decide whether to log transform because it's something he glosses over a little in the chapter, but he does talk about how it's an important thing to learn. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I get there is some feel to it, but um, I do, I, you know, it's useful to keep in mind. You you want things almost always for log transforming. You want things if 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 it shouldn't go below zero, uh, log transform might be useful. Um, and. Yeah, Boxcox transforms more generally. Lots of stuff happening in the chat. Anyone want to pipe up with any thoughts? And yeah, uh, Andrew Gelman says, log transform kids and don't listen to people who tell you otherwise. There's that. <laughs> and Tyler has lots of loud kids around him, so he can't speak up. Um, but he's there's too much to keep, keep up with in chat. Yeah, I can't say that I, I understand the hardcore statistics behind that decision. Um, but I've, I've seen it across multiple um, talks I've, I've watched and papers I've read yeah. um, specifically, it wasn't it not, not specifically housing, but anything in dollars and you have it's, big. Yeah. Anything big, where uh, you range. have, um, it's not negative. So negative mm -hmm. numbers don't make sense. So that right. it's helpful to log transform because then it can't, it can't go negative on the prediction side. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, Arjun pointed out that when you have a long tail, a big tail up, you know, in one direction, uh, log transform can help you deal with that because otherwise that one point that's way, way, way out to the right 
is going to like dominate everything. Um, right. So I've had it for um, cases when it's like a uh, number of seconds that something takes. Mm-hmm. And normally it'll be like, um, I do work with a lot with like student work and most students take, you know, between three to five minutes to answer this question. And this one student took five months. And so you don't want that one <laughs> to, uh, to wait everything. Now that one, I actually, in a lot of cases there, are, I have good reason to throw those out, but still having that log transformed helps it not be a totally crazy data point out there. Yeah. I, I don't know if I've seen people log transform the target variable in linear models because it helps it be, be more, more normal if there's you know, those, those big tails. I don't know if that has the same effect when you're using a tree-based model. Because there's there still that, that assumption or requirement that the target variable is normal. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't, uh, I don't think that there would be that assumption, but um, it's, it depends on how you're using it for sure. Um, yeah. And if anyone wants to step in or speak up, um, you are more than welcome. In, in tree-based models, uh, it's invariant under monotonic transformations. So if it's an increasing or decreasing transformation, it's gonna give you exactly the same predictions. So for tree-based, log transform doesn't really matter. What I've been talking about in the comments is usually when we're doing modeling, right, we're comparing the performance of tree-based models with other types of models, sometimes linear models. So usually we look, like our log transform stuff only, is only because I'm going to be comparing the, their performance at the end and I don't want to build a whole bunch of models that I've log transformed for like on one side and then a whole bunch that I haven't log transformed on the other side and then try to compare their performance sort of like in this sort of weird way. So I practically even for tree-based models like i've done the log transforms that's the like the logic is to make model comparisons later on more straightforward that totally makes sense yeah and that'd be cool to, to try i could train a model on the raw price and then compare that against the model that's 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 targeting the the log 10 of the price that, that would be inter- interesting to see the metrics on how it performs. Um, and Tony questions. points out Tony yeah. points out that you, you just look smarter if you log transform. So there is that. Of course. Um, of course. On the other hand, that that's the specific thing that um, uh, What's his name from uh, Financial Times who spoke at our studio Global? Mm -hmm. Um, Had to have the whole thing of, you know, like there are the data nerds who love the log transforms because we know what it means. Yeah, John Murdoch. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, but um, not everyone, like not all of, you know, it depends on your audience basically of whether you present the log transform. Now you can use it internally especially for modeling where it makes sense, but you want to make sure that you're presenting it to a lot of times stakeholders won't know what you mean. Like I work with a lot of scientists, so that's fine. But other times, you know, the marketing folks don't necessarily want the log transformed, for example, on an output. Sure. And that's why I use it in the model, but I don't, I I use just the dollars untransformed (laughs) in the, in the dashboard. Cool. All right, um, we're coming up on an hour, so uh, I guess you're you're almost at the bottom. So let's go ahead and finish. <laughs> yeah, um, this this one just shows um, when different types of houses were built. So I took like the top six most common types and just made a, a history, uh, not a histogram, but a count of the uh, the dates. That's a little little squeezed in there, but eighteen hundred to two thousand or two thousand twenty. Sorry. Um, so you know the different. There's a big post-war boom um, in Cape Cod. There's colonials were the most popular overall. There's big booms in multifamily. So those were when 
big apartment blocks were built, I assume, all at once. Um, so just interesting or understanding the, the context of the data there. Um, bathrooms was interesting. Um, so most have, this is a kind of count of observations or, or this, of the sales. So most have one full bath and no half baths, but then you get some variation. So two fulls and one and one half or two fulls and two halves. And then you get the, you know, crazy big houses with more bathrooms than bedrooms. You know, which, you know, I guess there's no accounting for taste. <clears throat> um, and this is just the full baths against the sale price. So definitely want to include that in the model because there's a positive relationship there. Um, and it gets a little hairy on the end just because that's, you know, those are outliers. And then same with half baths, positive relationship, not as, not as tight, but, you know, still interesting. Um, and then for, just for the UI, I was, trying to decide how many, uh, uh, for this is for the dashboard, trying to decide what is a logical start and end point for each of those sliders. Um, so I, I decided to have a cutoff on lot area, I think 40,000 square feet. Uh, there are definitely houses in the area that are bigger than that, but it makes it, if the slider is that big, it just makes it hard to use. And most people are not gonna be looking for houses in that range. So that was just something I, I, you know, decision I made not based on any real uh, process, just eyeballing it on the histogram. Um, and same for the square footage of the house. This one, it was a much smaller range. So I went, I, I went with the tail just for, for user friendliness because everyone can dream about a 10,000 10, square foot house. Um, yeah, so any, any questions about um, the model or this is my first like real shiny app, like besides the, the, the whole geyser thing. Um, so, uh, so in any, any, anything that people can see that I did wrong or could improve, definitely looking for, for, for feedback. Are there any general EDA tips that you picked up through this analysis? I always get through an EDA and I'm like, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that or I wouldn't do that again. Any tips you have? Um, definitely use those, um, just in terms of coding and speed, use the use across and mutate and use um, where within select just to quickly get to the stuff you want to look for and do a lot of transformations quickly. Um, I like to pivot long so if I have a whole bunch of categorical data with a, with one um, numeric column, I'll just, instead of having a column for each of those categorical things, I'll pivot all those long, and then I can just do a facet wrap in ggplot to compare all those in one thing and set the scales to probably like free or free y, um, just so I can look at it, look at it all at once. Um, if you have a bunch of, um, numeric data that you suspect is correlated, you can use the ggpairs package, I think it's called, and that lets you show the correlations and the scatter plots across multiple numeric columns at once. Um, I've, I've had good luck with that, that one in the past. Uh, Thanks, good tips. I, I had a question as well, I don't know. Um, uh, so for the rooms, the number of rooms and like, the other kind of like categorical numbered type of features. I was mm -hmm. wondering if you used like step other for those where, you know, if it's like four and more, like maybe there's only like so few of those, you kind of group them all together. Um, yeah, I, I treated those as numeric in the model. Um, I, did, I, didn't just, I didn't turn those into categorical things. Um, so this probably, there's definitely some noise on the tail ends of those, of those distributions. And again, those are all integers. So there's no, you can't have a half of a full bath. You can have one full bath and you can have a half of a half bath. You can only have one half bath. So there's definitely noise on the end of those things. Um, it, uh, it would be interesting to, to turn those into categories, but I, I wanted to keep it, keep the model, um, or, or the design matrix um, 
you know, as simple as possible, just, just as a matter of building it and see if it gets off the ground and flies. Yeah, at one point, I didn't catch what the predictor was, but you had a step other with threshold of 100%. Um, what was your thought process there? You wanted complete data only? Step other. Um, this is my recipe here. Um, so, step like 101. Other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, this is on the area. So, that's, that, it's not. 100% it's, it's the number of observations. So oh. if, there's, if there's fewer than 100 rows in that region, then it just transforms that region into other. Is it the same um, argument threshold or is it called N or something else? Yeah, it, it actually, I, I had a question on that when I was looking at it, um, recipe. Because um, without that, how would it know if it's a number or a percentage? Yeah, anything under one, it treats as a as a percent threshold. Okay. Um, anything over one, it treats as a number, as a count, I believe. Okay. Let me see if I can pull up the. Interesting. Yeah, so threshold. Yeah, between zero and one, or an inter integer greater or equal to one. Okay. That's that's interesting. So watch out for that kind of um, yeah, <laughs> like fuzzy setting. I saw that and I was like, why? Why does he have a threshold of hundred <laughs> percent? Yeah, it was definitely not the the way I would have thought about it. Okay. Um, I, like, and and it might not. It's kind of a weird thing for them to put in there. Because um, typically there's other there's multiple arguments for if it's right. a count or if it's a percent threshold. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess that was a design decision that they made. Cool. All right. Thanks. Hey Connor, in your recipe, mm -hmm. you transform the outcome variable, and then you have skip equals true. I've had trouble transforming my outcome variable in the recipe before. Is that yeah. true? What's the significance of that? That makes it so that when you bake it on a new data set, it it uh, it actually works. Um, I don't know the exact reason why, but I, I've I've read Julia Silgi's comments on Stack Overflow. She has some pretty good stuff on that. Um, it, it basically, if it doesn't have, if you didn't prep the model, then it doesn't have the data in it. I think. For the recipe, so then it doesn't know. It tries to log transform something that's not there yet, and it throws an error and fails. Yeah, skip it, exactly then it works in big. I think. Again, that's like it, that took me like an hour to figure out why my recipe was failing. I've I've definitely been there. Thank you. That's a that's a very useful tip. And I, I think there's a couple other steps like that where skip is is a argument that you can use if it's, I think it's, I think it's mostly when you're transforming the target variable where that's, that's relevant. Yeah, so this is the full um, recipe. This is the, this is the jankiest part. Um, and I'd probably undo it if I did it again. Um, but I was trying to upload this to shinyapps.io and the entire app has to be less than 100 megs. And when I saved my recipe, it was like 80 megs because it had the training data embedded in it. And then the bag tree fit model was like 200 megs. So I was like, whoa, this is not gonna work. So I, I, I found, I had, I had to get just enough data that I had all of the distinct, um, all the distinct options for GUID, for style description, grade description, and condition. And I set the seed up top so it, it's, it'll do the same thing every time. But I think now I, fi I figured out how to do it. So I, I shouldn't have to do that now, but I, that's just legacy code that hasn't been excised yet. It's the best kind, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> and we'll see a lot more about recipes in uh, two weeks when uh, Pavitra is going to talk to us about chapter six. Um, cool. That This was really cool. Uh, it was nice to see like a real world version of going through some data and figuring out how to work with it and, um, you know, what you have to do and all that. So that's cool. Um, next week, Ozma is going to talk to us about um, sampling data, spending, spending our data. Um, and I don't know, anyone have anything else that they want to, they want to bring up other than yes, thank you very much, Connor. This was very cool. Um, yeah, I appreciate all, all the feedback. Um, this is great questions and some ways for me to, to improve it for sure. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So I will see everyone next week and um, be sure to, like, I think we got all the links. We, we stalked you on GitHub and got the link to your repo. So um, you'll probably be mm -hmm. getting some comments there. Yeah, I, ju uh, I just pushed some more commits like an hour ago <laughs> to update the modeling pipeline. So um, if you looked at it yesterday, it's, there's some changes. All right. Very cool. All right. I'll see everyone on the Slack.